Hi everybody, welcome to Saturday Live at the Backyard Brew Center. Sorry we had been off for a couple of weeks, but uh, during that time I've had some suggestions on some programs to do and we're getting back in the swing here. So today the, the topic is European starlings. I was re requested that because this is the time of year that starlings tend to come hoarding into your bird feeders. We like to call them the motorcycle gangs around here. They travel in, in sometimes pretty large groups uh, and they come into your bird feeders. They take over your, your soot feeders, your bird baths, your, your seed feeders. And um, I, the people that had a request for more information about them and also how to battle them. So first off, I want to start with identifying them to make sure you're, you're not confusing them with a native species of this country, the common grackle. The, European starling was introduced into this country. I'll get into that in just a few minutes. But um, European starlings, like a lot of birds, have two kind of distinct plumages. They have a look in the winter, and that they, and then come spring, they're starting to mold even now. Um, they'll they'll look quite a bit different in the spring and breeding season. The picture up here now was taken in the fall, and this is considered fresh plumage for European starlings. They uh, have the speckled look to them, uh, and, they, it, and it's confusing or it can be misleading because people think that's quite literally their color, but believe it or not, um, those are nice fresh plumage, the, uh, the feathers are not worn yet. Those tips to the, each of those feathers have that uh, light or marking on them that gives them that speckledy look, and as the, the season goes on, as winter goes on, those tips wear on the ends of those feathers, and the bird becomes much more bright and much brighter and, and shiny and iridescent looking in the, the breeding season. Another thing that changes drastically in them is their bill color. In the fall and the early winter, they have a black bill. Um, in the breeding season, they have a bright yellow bill. I've got a picture I'm going to switch to here in just a minute to show you that transition. But one of the most distinct things about starlings is that for identification purposes and is separating them out from the common grackle, which is the common blackbird that we've all grown up with around here, is the size and length of the tail. Uh, starlings have very short stubby tails. They're a chunky little bird, whereas common grackle are long birds. They have very long tails. Um, and and they, I have a picture of those as well. So I'm going to switch first to from the, the fall slash winter starling picture. To the there he is. All right. To the, uh, the, a bird that is in winter but transitioning into spring. Now, I don't know how well this shows up it, uh, on the live video, but if you can see the color of this bill is changing from black to yellow. You can see the yellow starting to show up in it. And in about another two months, this bird's bill will be all yellow. Um, you can see, and, and this, for me, and like I said, I'm not sure if you can see, but you can see the purple iridescence starting to show up here in the throat area. So he's wearing off of these tips and uh, transitioning into his, uh, the, his breeding plumage. Now, remember, short, stubby, whereas common grackle, which a lot of people are, are familiar with, are much longer. See how much longer that tail is? They have that purplish head, the yellow eye. Uh, in the breeding plumage, and most for the most part, grackle are not here in the winter. Now we do have a few that that stay here, but the huge flocks of grackles go south uh, and spend the winter down in the Gulf Coast states and in big open fields. And if you do see grackle, a lot of times in the winter months here, they're usually out in farm fields, pastures, things like that. Not so much at your bird feeders. They start to show up at bird feeders usually late February, uh, early March is when you'll see the flocks of grackle coming in. Uh, and they're not very popular either. Now, the starlings are a whole different story. For they're, they're here all winter, and they're here in big groups in the winter. Whereas the grackle tend to be a problem in the spring for you. So, the grackle, yeah, and by the way, this one, there is a white, uh, this is an example of leucism. This is a, a, a grackle that has a white head. Uh, he's not uh, albino. He just has white feathers in his head area. And this bird is kind of a unique picture. So... Let's get back to the Mr. Starling here. Okay, the history of the, of the starling. It is a bird that is, in the orth ornithological terms, we call it an old world species. It is, uh, starlings are confined to Europe, Asia, and Africa. There were never any starlings in this, this whole half side of the planet. We, the North America, Central America, South America have no starling species that are native here. 
Now, back in the late eight, early 1890s, uh, an acting company in New York decided that America should be blessed with all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays. So one gentleman uh, brought over, went and trapped and brought over 60 European starlings and released them in Central Park in 1890. In 1891, he went and trapped 40 more and brought them and released those into Central Park. So all the European starlings, which there are many, that are in this country came from that 100 birds that were released in the late 1890s. And now they're in all 50 states and they are quite a problem, especially for our native birds, native cavity nesting birds in particular. You know, it's written at the turn of the century that uh, uh, Eastern bluebirds were as common as robins in the urban areas. Um, now you hardly have any of them in urban areas. And one of the big culprits, there are more reasons than just the starling. The starlings are one of the major culprits to that uh, demise of the bluebirds in urban settings. So, but starlings will run off all cavity nesting birds. I've seen them run off flickers. And you think, wow, a flicker's a lot bigger than a starling. But the problem is starlings gang up on these, get these birds that build these nests. They want, they want to nest in cavities too, but they don't build their own nests. They just take over other birds. So the starlings are very aggressive birds and they chase out native species. If you're a purple martin landlord, you certainly know uh, the, the problems you have with European starlings. They take over Martin houses, um, and, and this has been a big problem over the years. Uh, if you've ever seen a flock come into your bird bath, you know, you know why one of the reasons why we call them the motorcycle gangs, because they'll come in, take over a bird bath, and they'll all be out there ba bathing in it, and when they leave, it looks like a mud pit. Uh, these are, they're naturally, they do a lot of uh, dust bathing and stuff, and so they're very dirty birds, and they, they, they when you get to clean your bird bath out after a flock of them have been in it. So there are, they're, they're a problem that, it, they're a bird that not many people like. They, you could see that it, if they weren't so aggressive, and they weren't so, or so many of them, that they might be a popular bird, because they do actually, and in their own way, are, are quite pretty in their breeding plumage. So, um, but for, for, for bird feeder people, and, uh, uh, nesting bird landlords, their bird they really, really don't like. So how do we combat them? Well, in the nesting bird world, we've learned to reduce the size of the openings. They're pretty, pretty chunky birds, so they require a pretty good size hole to get into a nesting structure. So in bluebird houses, we reduce the hole size to an inch and a half, so it's just barely big enough for the, the bluebirds to squeeze through, and that eliminates uh, starlings from being able to get in them. Purple Martin houses, we've had, we use these crescent door shapes like this to replace your doors. And so, and we've been able to combat them in artificial nesting cavities. So natural, nest, natural nesting cavities, you know, nature has to take care of itself. But we've been able to battle them that way. Now at your bird feeder stations, there's, there's a couple different things you can do. Let me grab one of these. For, for seed feeding, they hate safflower seed. Safflower is seed is a wonderful seed to, to battle if you have big starling problems because they just don't like the seed. And you can put that out as, in your open trays where they can get to. They do, however, love suet. And that's a big problem for some people because they can go through a suet cake in a couple of hours uh, if there's a bunch of them attacking your suet feeder. So what they came out with many years ago was the up down side upside down suet feeder in which the the suet is exposed hanging underneath it like this. It takes a little bit of getting used to by our other birds, the woodpeckers and chickadees and titmice, but they can hang upside down all day long and it doesn't bother them. Whereas the chunky starling, their toes are not strong enough to sustain their weight for very long. So when they try to suspend upside down, they can peck on it, but then they fall off and flutter and they go back up and they try to poke at it almost like a hummingbird or something. But it really, really slows them down. Uh, and it may not eliminate them totally off your suet feeders, but it really slows them down and it's well worth the investment if you have suet problems with the starling. So another way to go is also excluding them, cage feeders. Cage feeders work great with suet and seed. There are, there are cage suet feeders, but this is a cage seed feeder. And they learned many years ago to take, the, if we extend this cage further out, that the starlings can't reach in there. It's not, their, their, their bill's not long enough. They can't get in there to the seed. So Excluding starlings is another way to battle them. So, not all birds are created equal. I think is the message they hear. So, um, if you like the programs, please share them. Get, give us a like. Send in ideas like the people have been doing to, for future programs. And come by and let's talk birds. Two, one.
Would you like to learn more about wild birds? You might want to hit that subscribe button.